Hi, I'm Ed Bacon, the rector of All Saints Church Pasadena. Whoever you are and wherever you find yourself on the journey of faith, I hope that you'll find something here that speaks to you. Welcome. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be aligned with your love, O God, our strength, our courage, and our freedom. Amen. Merry Christmas to you all. My friends, we've been gathered together tonight by the attraction of Christmas for a gentle yet profound corrective to our lives. It is true that Christmas is a gift to be observed and celebrated in the here and the now in personal ways. It's not just an ancient story that we tell for the purpose of nostalgia. Christmas does take place in your heart when you decide to love those around you, to take the first step to be at peace with a loved one or an enemy. When you meet someone who asks for help and you assist them with all your heart. When you take time to talk with someone who is lonely and sad. When you understand that resentment can be transformed by forgiveness when you let go of something to give to someone who needs it more than you, when you choose love and joy in the face of fear and negativity, it is true that when you do any of these things, you have turned that moment into Christmas, whether you're in December or the heat of August. And it is just as crucial that you and I here tonight, that the faiths that I'm aware of, which are represented in this room tonight, Judaism, Buddhism, Islam, and Christianity, all with their own distinctiveness, yet in harmony join in saying that the world, the way the world as it is functioning now, is not sustainable, and that there is another way. Before I spell that out, I want to note what a great honor and fortification it is to welcome interfaith partners of all saints, as well as those of you who are in the overflow room, thank you for staying, and those of you who are live streaming from throughout the world, welcome to you and Merry Christmas. Specifically, we welcome in particular our rabbi in residence Leonard Bierman, who just read the first lesson, and his family. Rabbi Kenneth Chasen, senior rabbi of Leo Beck Temple, and his family. I'm grateful that Muslim leaders from the Muslim Public Affairs Council are here tonight. Salam al Mariati, president with his mother in law, Jane Afara, who helps lead the All Saints Interfaith Study Group. Adina Lekovich, director of policy and programs here with her family, and Marion. Mohiuddin, Communications Director. My dear friend, Dr. Nazir Khaja, internationally distinguished physician and peace emissary. And Ken Fujimoto, Buddhist and community organizer, is here with his family. Your presence enriches us all. Welcome. And because I don't want to go any further into Christmas with any hurt feelings, I apologize to anybody I left off the list. (laughs) I had breakfast with a member of this faith community last week. He and I were talking over what had been for him a very rough patch in his life. Disrupted relationships, economic disorientation, recalculating his life on every front. At one point, he encapsulated his learnings this way. I had to learn to abandon my choice for the still, quiet voice. Distinguishing between my choice and the inner, still, quiet voice reminded me of the, for me, transformative words of Leonard Cohen 
in his documentary, I'm Your Man. Cohen speaks about his dying to one song in order to get to the song. He says, you abandon your masterpiece and then you can sink into the real masterpiece. For me, this year, Christmas is this light in the darkness saying to the human family, you have made choices that are not working. You have made choices that are in disharmony with the way the world is supposed to work, can work, and benefit everyone. Thomas Merton noticed, noted that we often go astray into our false self instead of our true self. When we invent our own, to use his words, salvation project, what my breakfast mate called the choice, and Leonard Cohen calls your masterpiece instead of the masterpiece. Our own invented salvation project is our homemade program for what we think will bring us security and happiness. It is our individualistic recipe for how we think the world works. It is the roadmap we have developed for our best life. It is the blueprint we rely on for making sense of the world. But according to all the religions of the world, God also has a salvation project, a program for happiness, peace, and security for all. God loves humanity so much that God has revealed to us the recipe by which the world actually works, the roadmap developed for our best life, the blueprint for how we can make sense of the world. Last weekend, when the Muslim Public Affairs Council gathered more than 700 or 800 people in this room for their convention at All Saints Church. They presented us with the most handsome antique bench at the conclusion of the proceedings. But at the beginning of the morning, they presented us with this beautiful crystal. On it is inscribed a passage from the Holy Quran, a revelation from Islam and from the Prophet Muhammad about God's salvation project. It is a Quranic verse making us conscious of what God considers to be beautiful. And those who give up themselves in the way of God, in times of hardship and of ease, and those who control their anger and forgive people, God loves those who act in charity and kindness. That gathering of Muslims meeting at a church, this church, was quite historic. Also of historic note is tonight's reading in Hebrew of the passage from Isaiah appointed for Christmas Eve. I thank our rabbi in residence, Leonard Bierman, for saying yes to my request to read for us at this liturgy. And at the 11 p.m. liturgy, Rabbi Joshua Levine Grader, the spiritual leader of the Pasadena Jewish Temple and Center, will read. I want to say with much emphasis that one of the reasons I have asked these rabbinic friends to read is to underscore my belief that the prophet Isaiah is not foretelling the birth of Jesus. Despite the Gospel of Matthew claiming so, that is to be reductionistic and to misinterpret Hebrew scriptures from what is called, and pardon me for taking you into my seminary class, from what is called a supersessionist lens. Supersessionism is a widely discounted notion by Christian Hebrew scholars claiming that Christianity has superseded Judaism. It has not. To live interreligiously in the 21st century is to disassociate ourselves from such destructive thinking. Judaism has claims that are distinct from and stand alone from Christianity that enrich us when we don't reduce them to be Christian prophecies. That distinction, therefore, makes it even clearer that Islam and Judaism and Christianity separately and yet harmoniously all reveal to us that God's salvation project 
is a project of nonviolence, compassion, justice, inclusion, and lifting the burdens of oppression from shoulders. You and I are made whole by becoming aligned with the only way the world will ever work, and that is with nonviolence, compassion, and justice. One translation of the Isaiah passage goes this way. And authority has settled on his shoulders. He has been named the mighty God is planning grace. The eternal father, a peaceable ruler. In token of abundant authority and of peace without limit upon David's throne and kingdom, that it may be firmly established in justice and in equity. Now and evermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts shall bring this to pass. So my Christmas thought to share with you this night is that Christmas does come into our personal lives when we express forgiveness and kindness in our interpersonal relationships. Christmas also calls us to correct a false salvation project that we as a nation and a culture have adopted. One goal of life, of course, is to align not only our personal and individual salvation projects with the salvation project of God, but to align our national and global salvation projects with the salvation project of God. Therein, we find the difference between the false self and the true self, both personally and as a people. The false self is our fabricating and then over-identifying with, becoming addicted to, and thereby even worshiping our homemade programs for happiness. On the other hand, the true self is dying to and bottoming out on our idolatrous programs and finding a new light, a new life aligned with God's sacred recipe for life, the way the world actually works. After the massacre of the 20 elementary school children in Newtown, Connecticut, Gary Wills wrote for the New York Review of Books that we Americans have made the gun an American idol. Recalling Leviticus, he noted that few crimes are more harshly forbidden in Hebrew scriptures than sacrifice to the god Moloch. The sacrifice referred to was of living children consumed in the fires of offering to Moloch. Ever since then, worship of Moloch has been the sign of a deeply degraded culture. Ancient Romans justified the destruction of Carthage by noting that children had been sacrificed to Moloch there. And Milton, represented Moloch as the first pagan god who joined Satan's war on humankind. First Moloch, horrid king, besmeared with blood of human sacrifice and parents' tears. Gary Wills wrote, we in our culture guarantee that crazed man after crazed man will have a flood of killing power readily supplied him. We have to make that offering out of devotion to our Moloch, our God. The gun is our Moloch. We sacrifice children to him daily, sometimes as at Sandy Hook, by directly throwing them into the fire hose of bullets from our protected private killing machines sometimes by blighting our children's lives by the death of a parent, a schoolmate, a teacher, a protector. Sometimes this is done by mass killings, eight this year. Sometimes by private offerings to the God, thousands this year. And let it be noted that there have been more than 100 gun shootings in the United States since Newtown. The answer to problems, Gary Wills argues, caused by guns in the 
words of the NRA, is more guns, millions of guns, guns everywhere, carried openly, carried secretly, in bars, in churches, in offices, in government buildings. The worship of Moloch, the gun, has the power to destroy the reasoning process. It forbids making logical connections. We are required to deny that there is any connection between the fact that we have the greatest number of guns in private hands and the greatest number of deaths from them. Thinking goes out the window when you're afraid. It has the power to distort our constitutional thinking. It says that the right to bear arms, quote unquote, a military term, gives anyone anywhere in our country the power to mow down civilians with military weapons. Even the Supreme Court has been cowed, reversing its long, own long history of recognizing that the Second Amendment applied to militias. Now the court feels bound to guarantee that every, any, and every madman can indulge his religion of slaughter. But in the midst of this false salvation project, my friends, we gather tonight around a manger to observe that when Christianity is not in the service of the Moloch, its corrective to idolatry is, the world, is that the world will never work by violence. In the humility of a manger, an animal's feeding trough, and only the nonviolent power of a child have the power to turn the human race into the human family and to end the sacrifice of children and others, be it to the violence of gun proliferation or to war, where thousands of children are killed by drone attacks authorized by our own beloved president. I have been choked up all afternoon at 3 p.m., our children's choirs led us in joyous alleluias, protected and safe in this room. And at the 5 p.m. Eucharist this afternoon, our teenage choirs brought me to tears with a Celtic arrangement of Silent Night. I have reveled all day in families being together bringing their children over to meet me or to, for me to see children I have baptized who are now grown and in college or families and jobs. The power of children, the nonviolent power of children is the corrective of Christmas in our false self-culture. I have remembered the first vision I had of my own daughter who melted me with her beauty. And our son who, when I first saw him, I broke into a dance involuntarily in the hospital hall. <laughs> my granddaughter, who when I held her for the first time and she fell asleep in my arms, after her breathing became synchronized with my breathing, and I learned in that moment what true prayer is, to be synchronized with the breath of God. And our grandson, who taught me that you really can tell the poten potential for how well a day can go by mommy looking at how beautiful the trees are. The nonviolent power of a baby is God's salvation project. And you and I are called together tonight to have our false selves and the false self of our nation and culture to be gently but profoundly corrected and transformed. A group at All Saints has begun organizing itself to make sure that we provide a wave an unstoppable wave of action to keep us from forgetting, to keep us from being distracted, to convert ourselves and to transform this country, to heal our religion of violence. We have a letter to President Obama, Speaker Boehner, and Senator Reid 
telling them that we insist on this major corrective. And we pray that you will go to our website and add your name to it before we send it to the White House and Congress. There is a saying that whenever everything seems dark, consider that you may be the light. That is what Christmas says. It's not a light external to us that comes. It's an external light that comes to awaken the light within us. I was thrilled that Abel Lopez at 5 p.m. preached about the song, This Little Light of Mine. I've been thinking all fall that it could be one of the most important hymns we ever sing. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Everywhere I go to overcome the idol of violence. So let us, my sisters and brothers, across faith lines, across every boundary that the culture of violence defines us by, let us together abandon our false choice and follow our internal voice. Amen.